Hola, soy Marita Alonso y hoy tengo el inmenso placer de hablar con Kathleen Moran, la autora de libros como Cómo ser una mujer, cómo ser una chica, cómo ser famosa y, por supuesto, Más que una mujer, que se ha traducido ya al castellano y al catalán y por ello tenemos esta inmensa oportunidad de hablar con ella. So Okay, Lynn, first question is, um, how different is the woman who wrote How to be a Woman from the woman of today? Uh, my hair is shorter, uh, my face is tireder, uh, my knees hurt a lot, um, and I think I've learned to be a bit, a bit gentler and kinder. The first book was written in this big, mad energy burst. And uh, and uh, I was sometimes impatient with people that I thought were stupid or wrong. And uh, I'm still impatient with people who are stupid or wrong, but I've learned to pretend to be a kinder person when I'm on social media. I think that's the big difference. <laughs> <laughs> and don't you think that uh, as women, we have to do that? Because men don't usually care when they're not being really kind. Yeah, to be called an unkind woman is one mm -hmm. of the worst things that you can be accused of. And also, you know, you get older... And, you know, I've really learned now that most people are having a terrible time, like however aggressive they might be on social media or confident or seem to have a perfect life. I now just presume everyone I'm talking to has someone they're looking after who's ill or is going through depression or anxiety. And so I just treat everybody like they're having a bad day. And I think that's generally quite a good rule to have as a human being. Just presume everyone's having a bad day because they probably are. Well, that's not really a very optimistic message, but it's completely true, I have to say. Yes, right. Especially after the last two years, like, you know, everybody's carrying around damage and stuff. And uh, I do like, you know, I, I'm a fan of the human race um, and I really like making people happy and I really like being useful. So uh, especially after the last couple of years we've had just trying to do things that are as useful and positive as possible. There's lots of things that I write about that are difficult subjects or difficult things that I've experienced in my life but I make sure that I don't turn it into a misery memoir it's not just basically about complaining whenever I share something bad about my life it's always with and then this is what I learned from it or this is how you could cope with it or this is how I could stop it happening to you um I really my favorite thing in the world is to be useful Yeah, I, I read somewhere that you said that the, the key to be confident for yourself is to be useful. So I'd like to know what are the most important lessons of this work? Oh, gosh. Um, important lessons. Trying to understand the difference between men and women, I think, is a very underrated thing at the moment. We're so used to talking about the war of the sexes. And if, you know, I've spent the last time, 10 years writing about women and feminism. And I think sometimes it's easy to just go, oh, this is all the problem of men or men have screwed this up or like, you know, the most difficult thing in a woman's life is dealing with the men around her. And over the 10 years, I've started to try and understand things from a male point of view. And basically my job now, I think, is explaining women to men and explaining men to women so that we can just understand and get on with each other. You know, we share the planet together. We're all giving birth to each other and marrying each other and working with each other and being related to each other. And so I'm very lucky that my job allows me to sit and think for a long time and go, why don't men understand this thing about women? And why don't women understand this thing about men? So because the book is sort of concentrating on the domestic life now, now I'm middle aged. The first book was about being a young woman and working out who you are, you know, with your sexuality and your style and your politics and kind of. When you're younger, all your problems are basically your problems. It's to do with working out who you are. And when you get to middle age, all your problems become other people and their problems. You are the person who is taking care of everybody. You are a mother, you're a colleague, you're looking after aging parents or parents who might be dying. You're taking care of everybody and solving everybody else's problems. And one thing women tend to say at this age is it's generally women who have to bear the burden of looking after children, looking after aging parents. We're the ones that run around keeping society together. And it's very easy to go, well, men aren't doing this because they're bad or lazy. Um, and I wanted to look into why it is that men don't see these problems and don't see why they need to be involved in it. And you know, it goes back to their childhoods and the difference in the way that we bring up men and women. And I realized all this when my brother came to live with me for a couple of years. And I was like, well, we've got the same parents. We grew up in the same place. Uh, we, we had the same income, but he sees the world so differently to me. Why is that? 
and picking that apart and working out why it was uh, was one of my favourite bits in the book, just working out the difference between what we think women should be and what we think men should be. So maybe now you should write a book called How to Be a Man. Well, strange you should say that. This is my work board for the oh next book. Oh, my God. Yeah, and the next book is called What About the Men? Because as a feminist and any woman who's written about women will say that this is true, if you go and do a public event and you get questions from the audience, guaranteed the third question you will get asked is, but what about men? You've talked a lot about women now, but what about men? And for the first six or seven years, I was like, I don't care. Like, my specialist subject is women. Like, if men have problems, men need to sort them out. It would be the ultimate irony of feminism if women had to sort out all of women's problems and then sort out all of men's problems as well. Like, no. But recently, I've started to realize, no, that what about men? Because women have got this amazing thing called feminism, which is this network of tools that allow us to understand everything that might be difficult or shameful or problematic or embarrassing about being a woman. Any problem you've got as a woman, type it into the Internet and another woman somewhere will have experienced it and will be talking about it and how she overcame that problem. Men don't have that network. Men don't talk to each other about their problems. Men don't have these role models. No one's writing songs about how great it is to be a young man. There isn't this sense that the future is going to be male. We all think the future is going to be female. And so I started to think, yeah, what about men? So I just made a list of their problems. And that's oh. the book I'm writing now. And um, I'm loving it. It's really enjoyable. <laughs> Oh, my God. Um, and what do you think about uh, how much it's been written about how we deal with men? But what about what how we deal with women? Because it hasn't been spoken about. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Like when you see women who talk about being a woman, we, yeah. we tend to be very funny about it. We tend to be very open about it. But the only people I really see writing about the problems of being men are quite extreme characters. People like Jordan B. Peterson whose whole thing is the problems that men have is that they're not manly enough. They need to be more alpha. They need to be more masculine. And that's not my reading of the situation. The problems that men have is usually with their mental health. They feel that they are not as big a parent as the mother, that the mother is more important than the father. And they, these are all female things. You know, I think a lot of the problems of men is that they, for some reason, don't feel that they can do things that are seen as female. Whereas women, We saw a bunch of stuff that men did 100 years ago at the start of feminism. We were like, I'll have that. I want to have a job. I want to have money. I want to be able to talk about sex. I want to be able to wear trousers. I want to rule a country. So women went and took all the things of men that we thought were cool, and we have enjoyed it. Thank you very much. But men don't seem to feel that they can come and take these female things that I think would make their lives better and more fun and more joyful. So, uh, so yeah, it's basically a whole book basically going, try and be more like women. Men, that's your problem. <laughs> And how can we make middle-aged women take up this space? This is a key thing. So when I wrote the first book, when I would do public events, most of the people who came were young women, teenagers, women in their early 20s. And I would meet them. We'd talk for hours and we'd take pictures together and they would tell me about their lives and their plans and their dreams. They were full of confidence and just telling me about their lives. And then as time has gone on, my audience has got a lot older and I'll be meeting middle-aged women and I'll say, come and have a picture taken with me. And they'll be like, oh God, no, I'm too ugly. I'm too fat. I'm too tall. Don't take a picture of me. And I'll go, well, you're not, but tell me about your life. What do you do? And they'll go, I'm too boring. Oh, you don't want to talk to me. My life is so boring. I'm nothing. And then I would talk to them and it would turn out that they are politicians or doctors or scientists. And I wanted to say to middle-aged women, you are incredible. You need to learn to take up your space. Your stories are amazing. The work, particularly of middle-aged women, is the most important stuff. We tend to think of middle-aged women's lives as being boring. It's all about running a house, being a mother, looking after your parents, being you know dutiful at work, and thinking that this is boring stuff. But this is the big life or death stuff. We're literally helping people as they die. We are keeping people alive. We are making love and security and serenity. The stuff that goes on in the normal house is as dramatic as anything you will ever see in a Hollywood movie, but we never talk about it in those terms. So the book I wanted to write was going inside every house, every normal, boring suburban house, there is something life or death going on guaranteed at some point in your life. I want to shine a spotlight into these houses tell these stories like that they're big Hollywood epics and shine the spotlight on these middle-aged women and go, you are the star. I'm going to tell your story like it's the most important story on earth because it is. Without women, this whole world would collapse in a week. 
And thank God now we start having more films about motherhood, but in a sense that it's not perfection. And I don't really remember the name of the film, the the daughter, I think it's called, the one that Maggie Olivia Coleman, Hall, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's amazing. So yeah. I, I want to know, is motherhood as scary as it sounds? Oh, more so. Even with the most honest and brutal stories that we've had recently, usually, you know, the stories resolve. They're only an hour and a half. You have no idea how long motherhood is. Even if you've got a movie that's got like one big dramatic incident that a woman's battling with as a mother with her children, it's all over in an hour and a half. And then you're like, oh, that's over. Motherhood just goes on forever. There's a bit in the book where I just go, motherhood is so long. And I type about 30 O's, like long. But of course, in order to say that word correctly, you'd be saying it for 20 years. Because that's how long minimum it is really to raise your children. And it's constant. There's no time off. You don't get any bonuses for good work. And the people that you're raising are often very ungrateful. When they're young, they will kick you or poo on you. Uh, and no one ever goes, hey, you did a great job today. They're just like, mommy, I want a drink of water at two o'clock in the morning. They don't even let you sleep. So, um, so yeah, it's the older women tend not to tell the younger women how hard it is. Because we want you to have babies so that you can join us in our club and we can all move back <laughs> <it> together. <laughs> So what would you have uh, wanted to know before being a mother that you didn't? I think the key thing to, I had so many mad ideas about what motherhood was like. For some reason, I thought I would have more time. I just, I think because JK Rowling talks about how she wrote her first book with her baby in a pram in a coffee shop. And I was like, yeah, I'll do that. I'll like put my baby in a box under the table and I'll write all these plays and novels. Here's the big truth about motherhood. Whatever your life is like the day before you have your baby, it will be like that, exactly like that 10 years later. So if there's a curtain that you meant to put up the day before you give birth and you haven't put it up on the window, it will still be on the floor by the window 10 years later. Nothing changes. All you're doing is looking after this baby. So make sure you've got your life in order. Make sure you put your curtains up. <laughs> make sure you've cleaned the toilet before you give birth because you won't be cleaning it again for five years. And of course, this is the bit where you have to then go, but of course, it's the most magical thing in the world. And like, you know, I love my children and they're the best people I know. And they are. They're absolutely excellent. They're 18 and 20 now. So this is the sweet bit. They've got cars. They drive me around. They cook food. They're so funny. We've got all these in-jokes. There's no one I'd rather spend time with. But it's a lot of work to get to that point. Um, so, yeah, you've just got to really be aware that like it's it's 20 years of, of not much fun. <laughs> Oh Sorry if you're pregnant out there. Sorry. Oh, no, no. Put the curtain up now. <laughs> but before the book, I thought the scary thing about growing old were wrinkles. But now I think it's the amount of responsibility. I mean, when you write the book, you make it clear that you have no time for yourself. That's kind of the good bit, though, if you like getting things done, like kind of in middle age, I, I, I would not. My children look at me when I'm moaning about how much my back hurts or how tired I am. And they're like, would you like to be my age? And I think they always want me to go. Yes, I would love to be a teenager again. I would hate it. I would never be in my teens again. I would never be in my 20s. I wouldn't do my 30s again. At this age, I you're so bold and brave you just don't care what other people say you finally got over that worry that you might get fired if you're ugly or <laughs> stupid for one day like kind of you don't get fired at this age if you've got a job you'll stay in that job if you say what you think you don't get fired if you say what you think you don't lose your friends it's fine you finally in your 40s have the confidence of a teenage boy that's basically what you get which is great because teenage boys think they're awesome <laughs> And in the book you write about uh, how women usually like uh, when they're younger, the bad boys, which is something mm. really terrible. And now that I'm watching, I don't know, you usually watch that kind of crap in uh, Netflix. There are many dating shows. Yes. Oh, yeah. And and there's one specifically now that uh, she's into a very toxic relationship and she suddenly gives up. Uh, at the moment, she says, I'm too tired. And you said that once. So I want to know why we keep on going on these terrible relationships until we can't really move. That's the key moment. And you'll notice whenever you're talking to your friends, if they're going out with someone terrible and they're moaning about them all the time and crying, you know 
that they will not leave that person until the day they finally stop being angry or sad or disappointed and they turn up and they go, I'm tired now. I can't do this relationship anymore. I'm too tired. The problem is, I don't think it's particularly that women are attracted to bad men. It's just that, like, there's not that much choice. You know what I mean? It's not like women are rejecting hundreds of thousands of Mark Ruffalo's. Like, it's not like there's thousands of brilliant liberal men going, I love housework and oral sex. Like, please put me on your waiting list. Like, you're making do with the best of a bad bunch. And that's why the book I'm writing after this is about, at my age, all the women that I know that are still single, they can't find the, the amount of good women is so in excess of the amount of good men. Like there aren't any available. They're all married at this age. They're all dead like that. They're, they're gone. And so in this book, these women who work in tech make the ideal robot husbands. They're like, OK, we're going to stop looking for men. We're going to make them. We're just going to make the perfect robot husband. And of course, obviously, it goes wrong because it's basically a Frankenstein story. But that's kind of you know there's a reason why everyone I've told that to of my age has gone yes I want to read that book because it's not like we're lazy and can't find them it's not like we love a bad man it's just like there's a lot of them out there and the next book is going to be uh, about men but it's not going to be for men because I, I think many men find it intimidating reading your books because they feel like they haven't been written for them because they are so used to having everything done for them Well, it's been interesting. Like when we when I sold the book to my publishers in the UK, they were like, we better hope a lot of women buy this because no man will buy a book called How to Be a Woman. And for the first couple of months, it was women that were buying it. And then about three months in, it turned out that about half my readership was male because they were seeing it like an instruction manual. It was like a kind of Bible of like, oh, my God, that's when my wife says I've got nothing to wear today. Oh, this is what she means. Right? Okay, I get this. So men are reading this. They would tell me they'd have to read it secretly. Like if they were on the tube, they'd have to like, or on the bus, they'd have to like cover up the actual cover with like a yeah. men's magazine, like a fishing magazine or a porn mag. And they'd secretly be reading it behind the magazine. Um, and so, and also what I find is that women tend to give it to men and go, just read this and then you'll understand. So, um, so I suspect this book will be the same. I don't think men will buy it, but women will buy it and give it to men going, you keep moaning about your problems, read this. That's the solution. So maybe you should add a page in which you tell women to buy for men so that you sell even more. Oh, yeah. No, that's my presumption. Yeah, it, yeah. it will all be women buying it for their men. <laughs> and that's good. I mean, I'm, I'm writing a lot of it towards teenage boys. And I, I know so many mothers who are like, It would be too awkward for me to have conversations about, I don't know, pornography or kind of your sex life. But here it all is in a book. Read this. This is how you can become a better man. Yeah. And I don't know how you feel about your work in the past. But uh, when I read something I wrote like a week ago, I always tend to think it's rubbish. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there's something specific you wrote once that you really regret. Oh, you go in a cycle. So usually there's the bit, there's, you go through all of the emotions when you write something. So sort of at the beginning, when you have the idea, you're like, this is the best idea in the world. Why has no one written it? Then you start writing, you go, this is still a great idea, but I know why no one's written it because it's really hard to write. Then it comes out and you're like, oh no, it was a really good idea, but I've completely screwed it up. And then 10 years later, you read it and go, this is amazing. Why didn't I like it at the time? It's exactly the same with photographs of yourself. If you go back and look at a photograph of yourself 10 years ago, you're like, oh, my God, I looked amazing. I was so hot. Why didn't I fancy myself now? And like now I'm like, oh, God, I'm so old now. I look terrible. In 10 years time, I'll look at a picture of me now and go, wow, I was amazing. Why didn't I appreciate it? So this is the human brain, isn't it? We always doubt ourselves at, at some point. And how can we stop those little silly boys? What stops silly boys from being silly? No. Well, yes, yeah, from being a bitch, basically, like <laughs> telling us we are ugly, we are bad, we are silly. Oh, the voice in your head. Oh, yeah. you have to. Okay, so that's difficult. First of all, it's recognizing you do have a voice in your head and that it must have like been created over years. And the yeah. voice in your head that's being horrible to you will be a combination of maybe stuff your parents said, maybe a horrible teacher, a bad boyfriend, a bitchy friend that you've dumped. And they're all still in there going, oh, you're fat, you're ugly, you're lazy, you're terrible so first of all you've got to recognize that that is a voice in your head but yeah. it's in your head and you can control that and you need to start being kind to yourself and the easiest and quickest way to do that is to get a dog because if you get a dog 
guaranteed within 24 hours you'll realize that you've spent all your time saying to this dog you're so beautiful you're such a good girl oh you're so clever oh you're working so hard even though your dog is stupid and just lying on the floor and doing nothing and there should be a moment about 24 hours in when you go hang on I've been nicer to this dog in 24 hours than I've ever been to myself I need to start talking to myself like I am my own pet dog so that's what I do now. I take myself for walks when I'm feeling a bit sad. I make sure I have a snack if I've been good. I make sure that I get to go to sleep um, and be curled up. And, you know, sometimes I chase cats, but that's just me. Um, but treating yourself like you're your own pet dog. Only be as kind to yourself as you would be to your best friend or your dog. Well, hopefully you didn't end up peeing on the floor. But... I have done that. My husband was quite angry. It was a big party. <laughs> Apparently, I came home and just did a wee wee on the floor whilst going, I don't know where the toilet is. He was so angry the next day. <laughs> that was a long time ago. I don't do that kind of stuff now. Who knows? Who knows? And, and about what you said, it, apparently being a modern woman requires hating yourself. So don't you think that especially female comics spend lots of time like uh, saying terrible things about themselves? We should change that. Yes, that's definitely a modern thing. And that is, I mean, it's great that women are being honest about the voices in their head, but we've done that bit now. Every yeah. female comedian I know has like a 10 minute bit in their set about like how stupid they are or how ugly they are or how bad they are in bed. And we need to move past that bit now because it's all part of the same female thing that you've got to be seen to put yourself down. You could never say, I wrote a column for the Times recently that it's taken me 10 years to get the courage to write going, I think I'm really beautiful. Like not in a kind of like you're all rubbish and like I'm really hot and sexy, like don't even look at me. Just kind of like I really like how I look. I'm really happy with how I am because I've decided that I like myself. Why would I wait for someone to tell me I'm beautiful? And I write these columns hoping that teenage girls are reading it, reading it because teenage girls are waiting so hard for another girl or another boy to say to them, you're beautiful before they can believe they're beautiful. Why would you wait? Why would you trust someone else's opinion? You know, you don't let other people tell you what music to wear or what food you like. Why would you wait for someone else's opinion to tell you if you are officially a person with a good face or not? You just have to look in the mirror and go, yep, this is my face. I really like it. I look like a kind, nice, funny person. I think I'm really hot. And just look in the mirror and say it. You can feel different parts of your brain lighting up when you look in the mirror and go, oh, look, Ace, hello. And just wave at yourself in the morning. Hiya, it's another day. Hooray for this face. <laughs> And now that we're speaking about looking at ourselves in the mirror, tell me about Botox and how you change your mind. Yes. Well, I haven't had it for two years now, mainly because I'm too lazy. Um, oh. And I wanted, to I wanted to spend the money on, uh, on plants for my garden. But uh, a couple of years ago, I was, uh, I'd been very sad. My daughter had been very ill and I just looked old and sad. My face had just been like crying so much you could tell. Um, and I went and got Botox. And I couldn't wait to write about it because in the beauty magazines, I can't say the famous people's name. I can't name the celebrities, but there are four or five celebrities that are always mentioned when we talk about women who are growing old gracefully and not having any surgery or Botox. We're always like, look, they have grown old naturally. So why are these other women having Botox and ruining things for themselves? I know those women have had Botox. I go to their Botox clinic like kind of everybody in the end because I'm a journalist I know what they've had done they've had it done and the the thing that I dislike about that in terms of feminism is that it means that normal women are looking at these women and going oh god they are so beautiful I must I will never be that beautiful they must be of a different species like I am a goblin I am a gnome I can never look as beautiful as them and it's like if you want to look like them you can and rather than going and having like two hour long facials or using, you know, all, all these, you know, natural feminist things, you can go and have an injection and it will make you look like your face, like you've basically when you have Botox, it makes you look like you've just come back from an amazing holiday. And if you can't afford to go on an amazing holiday because you're very busy and poor, it's far cheaper and quicker to just go and get some Botox. And that is the effect that Botox will have. But as I say, I loved to defend it. I love to tell the truth about it, but I also can't be bothered to do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so um you always make like feminism available to everyone and uh, I guess you've been criticized for that well I mean only by stupid people really um the whole point about feminism is the it's the idea that women are equal to men should be equal to men are equal to men so that's a belief 
And so feminism will only work if everyone believes that, because if half the population still thinks women are stupid or, or unable to do these jobs or somehow inferior, we won't have feminism. We won't live in a feminist world. We will not have felt the effects of feminism. So this idea that you find sometimes in feminism that only special, perfect people can be feminist and that we only write about feminism in difficult, hard to read books that only clever people can read and that there are special words that you have to use in order to prove that you're a feminist. If you've got a brilliant idea that you genuinely think will make the world better, that women are equal, why would you hide it in a special place and only let certain special people use it and say that they are that? Like feminism needs to be spread as much as possible. You need to explain to people you are a feminist. You lead a feminist life. If you got educated, if you have a job, you know, if you believe in the laws that keep women safe from sexual abuse, uh, if you would believe that women should be able to own their own money and property, um, then you are a feminist already. Like kind of allow me to tell you this brilliant news. You've been a feminist all your life. And you think RuPaul is like the best show to teach how to be a woman. So I want to know why first. Well, so I've got teenage daughters now. And as they were going out of their childhood and into their teenage years, so they're experimenting with makeup and hair and the clothes they wear and the whole sort of persona they're going to have, who their future self is going to be. It was very difficult to describe to them how you construct that and what the good and bad things can be about that and why you make choices and what these signals are that you're sending out if you dress in a certain way or you act in a certain way until I watch RuPaul's Drag Race. Because in that, it shows the gamification of femininity. You're seeing men pretending to be dressing up as women. They're showing you how you construct the persona of a woman and what wearing this outfit says about you, what that outfit says about you, what to do with your hair and makeup, how to act. So seeing it in a game show, how you become a woman, allows you to have these amazing conversations with girls about what these things mean, what these signals are, and preparing them for the outside world. Because Mama Roo is very good at testing her little drag babies and making sure that they're ready to go out into clubs, that they're ready to be on stage, that they're going to be able to deal with the abuse that they might get because of how they look. If they're particularly sexual, you are going to have people shouting things at you. And similarly, if you're a teenage girl and you go out looking very sexual, you are going to have men leaning out of their car window shouting, nice tits. And you need to prepare your girls for that. And so watching RuPaul's Drag Race is the perfect uh, educational experience for a mother and a daughter to watch together because I get to be Mama Ru and they get to be my little drag babies. <laughs> and what could you say to those who think that uh, RuPaul and the TV show uh, mocks at femininity? Well, it does. And I've written about that. Like the phrase hog body, where they're talking yeah. about how all girls have to, like all the queens have to have a cinched in waist. Yeah. Like, you know, that is wrong. Uh, you know, lots of women do, lots of women have a hog body. I have a hog body and like I am, I am an actual woman. Um, so yeah, there's these, you know, there's these things, the whole fishy thing, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, saying that you can only be a woman if you have a fish smell, uh, you know, that's not good. But the drag community is very aware of this. This is one of the great things about the fact that drag has become so mainstream. A lot of cis women have been able to just go, hang on a minute, I get that it's a joke or that that's the game, but you know, everyone's watching this now. And these are, you know, this is not all, you know, let us tell you a little bit about being a woman. Allow us to occasionally <laughs> tell you a bit of information about being a woman. And do you think it could be different now if you had someone as Lizzo as a pop reference when you were a teenager? So oh, like Lizzo, oh gosh, yeah. I mean, just seeing, there's that feminist saying, I cannot be what I cannot see. So I grew up, I was a very big girl, very fat girl. and I never saw anybody who looked like me anywhere. They were not in movies, they were not on TV, they weren't in advertisements. And so as a child, you're just making a very simple assumption. You're just going, well, my body is wrong and it doesn't exist in the outside world. So I'm basically going to just disassociate from my body and pretend I'm just a head and a face and a brain and just forget about my body. And that's a really dangerous thing for a woman to do because once you become disassociated from your body and you think it has no worth and it's not really anything to do with you, You can be very horrible to that body. You can self-harm. You can get eating disorders. You can uh, have abusive sexual relationships where people are doing things to your body that you're, you're just letting happen because you're like, oh, that's not me. They can do what they want. Um, so someone like Lizzo coming along, looking so magnificent and so happy and being so body positive. When I went to the Glastonbury Festival, she had 20 big girls on stage with her and they were all, all in leotards, shaking their bums at the audience. If I had seen that when I was 16, I think the next 10 years of me hating my body and pretending it didn't exist would never have happened because 
Lizzo looks like a queen. And if you if I see it, I can be it like kind of I can be a happy big woman. I can be a sexy big woman. I can be a positive big woman. This is why like this is why I'm very against us ever picking holes in our heroes. It's a big thing on social yeah. media at the moment that as soon as a woman has any kind of success or is any kind of a positive role model, there's kind of a game. There's like a chase where it's like, OK, who's going to be the first person to notice when she's done a wrong thing, said a wrong thing? Let's go back 10 years and see if she said something stupid when she was 14 and destroy her. Yeah. And every time we destroy a really good female role model because of one or two mistakes they've made, we screw it up for all of us. We need as many women out there as possible being positive role models. And we need to be able to forgive women for making a mistake because our children are watching this. And if they are watching these brilliant women being destroyed for making one mistake, they're thinking, oh, God, well, I should never even try to do something, because if I make one mistake, the entire Internet will turn on me and I will be shamed and destroyed. And that kind of fear in being a woman that you, unless you're 100 percent perfect all the time, then you should just stay at home, never say anything and never do anything is so destructive to us. And women are just as guilty as this as men. In fact, perhaps more so. Usually when you get that kind of abuse on the internet, it tends to be women, not men who are doing it. Mainly because men don't notice what women are doing. But, you know, that's our biggest flaw as a gender. We will only accept perfect women. And I'm very much, everything I write is very much about no one is perfect. You know, come on, you know, let's all just try and be as pleasant as possible. What I really like about you is that, for example, Nora Ephron uh, always wrote about, uh, even with you more, uh, about the inglorious side of growing up. But you sort of celebrate that, right? Like you. Yeah, well, that's because that's that's what you want to read, right? Like kind of no one wants to read a book about someone being perfect and having an easy life. Like you want the gossip and you want what I want as a reader is I want people to tell me about all their shameful moments everything that was secret, everything that's taboo. Like as a writer, you're just like, well, that's the stuff no one's writing about. Like it's like being a footballer and you're like running down the pitch and it's an open goal. Like no one else is running in this direction. I'm going to do that. Um, and that's the stuff that the readers love the most because I think we all tend to think, particularly as women, if something's going wrong in our lives, it must have been us. We screwed it up. We're particularly disgusting. We're particularly awful. We're particularly stupid. We've done something wrong. And when you write in a book about how you've had that exact same experience, then you get women all over the world going, oh, my God, it wasn't just me. This is what happens to women. I feel normal now. And that's yeah. the thing that I get women coming up to me and saying the most. I read this about abortion or being fat or having an eating disorder or self-harming or whatever it is. And now I feel normal. Now I know there are other women doing it. And now I know how to get through it. And that's my greatest joy that I can make a woman read a book and laugh and cry and go, oh, God, I feel normal now. Because more than anything else, more than eating chips or having sex, humans <laughs> want to feel like they're normal. That's our biggest drive. We want to feel like we're just normal people. And the last question is, I mean, your next book, what about men? So when is going to be the next one about menopause? So I've got to wait until I have it. I'm really annoyed. I'm like, come on. I need my <laughs> woman ovaries to stop. I'm like, come on, stop. I need to know what it's like. But so far, keep having those periods, which is annoying because A, periods are annoying. And B, I can't write this next book. But yeah, the next book will be all about the menopause. I think they're going to be every 10 years. And then the last one will be called How to Die. And I'll be on my deathbed typing it. And then I'll press the last word and press send. And then I'll die. And that will be it. A whole life in a series of books that hopefully are useful and amusing and make people feel normal. Even about dying. Dying is normal. <laughs> so thank you so much for your time. It was amazing. I'm really looking forward to reading the next one. Oh, Marita, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your time and have a great evening. You too, darling. Lots of love from Feminist London. Bye. <laughs> Bye.